The following is a presentation of Peoria Nazarene Church. We are a church that seeks to make, mature, and multiply followers of Jesus Christ among all people. For more information about Peoria Nazarene Church, visit peorianazarene.church. Well, it's so good to be with each one of you today. And uh, uh, just to share something out of my heart um, why I, of why I love the church. Um, I know the church is far from perfect. I know that the church at times, I'm speaking of the church in general, at times has helped people come to find and follow Jesus. At times it's hindered people from doing that when people have failed to live up to the gospel, to the love of God. But I'm thankful to be a part of a church that, while we're not perfect, uh, there's family here. And I'm, I'm so grateful for that. And I just was reminded of that this morning. And just sharing from my heart, we don't make it a custom of naming names from the platform, so if you're a guest, we never call you out or anything like that, but just walking in this morning and, uh, and uh, you know, seeing uh, different people around here that uh, uh, just the hugs, the, the embraces, the love that is shared, and uh, particularly uh, just from my vantage point, and I shared out of my vantage point because I think this is what you, you either do experience here or you will. Uh, just coming in knowing um, that I have my own loss this time of the year around the holidays that I'm grieving, having lost my father, but then seeing my good friend, uh, my sister in Christ, Dee, uh, who just lost a sister this week, coming over and giving me a big hug. Um, you know, walking through the aisles here, uh, just seeing uh, Karen Casson. I'm going to pick on you for a moment. Um, I was there with her when she lost a family uh, the past couple years, and she's been there for me and losing a family, and just being able to see people that um, there's real family, uh, walking over, hugging my own mom who sits here, and seeing the tears in her eyes, and her saying, I'm so thankful Fred Dirtle's here today, and the joy, and, uh, and just seeing the, what the body of Christ can be. Um, it's not just about our strengths. It's not just about those things and how we better each other. It's about how we share in and out of real life hurts and, and, and hangups and hardships. And uh, so it just is, it's just so wonderful to know that no matter what you're experiencing in your personal life, maybe you feel a little bit of the absence of family. Um, as you start a new year, it's hard to believe, in just a couple weeks from now, as you start a new decade, um, you can enter into that knowing that you can belong to a family. Um, and it's a family where uh, no personality is the head. I'm not the head of the family. <laughs> We'd be in trouble if I, if I was. But it's God, our Father, our Creator. And today we're going to talk a little bit about this gift of Christ and uh, just to know that we can enter into a new year and finish this year knowing that because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are fully known and we are fully loved. Many times in human relationships, there's a little bit of a, a disconnect there. Um, we, we, we might believe that we're loved or we think we're loved, but there's always this question, if people really knew me on my bad days, would they really love me? And the wonderful news of the gospel, uh, it is that we are fully known. There's nothing hidden from God. Um, and to be fully known Yet to be fully loved is the most liberating truth that you could experience in your life. And to know that God, your creator, fully knows and fully loves you. And our desire as a church is to be that place where, where you can be you, you can be broken, and you can know that you're loved by God and you're loved by this church family. So enough of that. That's a little extra there today, but I just wanted to share that out of my heart. Uh, today we're going to continue in this series we're calling Rediscovering Christmas, and we're going to look at one of the most well-known Christmas characters, and that is Mary, Mary the mother of God, the mother of Jesus. But before we get there, I just want to ask you maybe to think about when was the last time that you were really excited? Now, I'm not, I'm not wanting you to think about, uh, you know, like the kind of excitement that comes from when your sports team wins. And you jump up and you, and you shout with glee and celebration. Don't think about that, but, but in a real-life situation, when's the last time that you were really, really excited? I mean, to the point where you had to tell somebody. Um, in fact, maybe it was to the point where uh, physically and uh, on the outside, you expressed that with a, 
you know, uh, with, with tears, with a shout, with, with excitement, with maybe if you're somebody who just can't sit still and you got to move to celebrate, uh, you celebrated, you were excited. And I think of uh, some of the examples that we see uh, probably most commonly in our culture today of, of this level of excitement that can't be contained is when you think of some of the well-known TV shows of America, American, America's Got Talent or American Idol. And uh, if you've ever watched one of those shows, uh, oftentimes you'll see that when somebody makes it through an audition or they get the ticket to Hollywood, they cannot keep it in. In fact, it's almost humorous at how excited they become, the rejoicing, the laughter, the excitement, the unexpected, receiving the unexpected with joy and happiness. And I particularly love those parts of those shows when somebody from an external appearance or maybe a quirky personality appears that most of us are, our eyes are for the people. Like that person looks like a musician. They have the look, they've got the hair, they've got the jeans, and this person's going to be good. But then there's this person that maybe they're a little too old to make it, we would think, or, or they don't fit that, that preconceived idea of what uh, a celebrity would look like, and then they have this hidden talent that just wows everybody, and there's this excitement and, and, and just this, this, this unbelief at what's taking place. And today we're going to look at a, a story here that I, I think we can miss that level of excitement that takes place in the story, but it is there. Mary, the mother of God, and not only hearing from the angel about what God is doing in her through the coming of Christ and, and, what, and how what is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. But, but after that, when greeting her family member, Elizabeth, there is genuine excitement that cannot be contained for what God has done. And out of this, the, the circumstances that we're going to encounter today that may seem a little different, we have a beautiful example of what it really means to know God, what it really means to follow Jesus and be a Christ follower. In fact, Mary really is a primary example of what faith looks like. And it's important that we recapture that, that we slow down enough to consider Mary's example, that we don't just rush to the birth of Jesus and then move on, but here we have the gospel before the gospel if you will, before John the Baptist announces to, for people to turn away from their sins and turn to God and believe the gospel, before Jesus begins his public ministry declaring the gospel, here in what we see in the life of Mary, we have the gospel even before the gospel is presented. So I want to share this with you, Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 38. In this passage, we see that God is the Savior of the poor and the humble, he responds with his power and grace to those who will embrace Mary's posture of humble obedience. So let's look at her example together. Verse 26, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. And you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel. Since I am a virgin. The angel answered. The Holy Spirit will come on you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. 
for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. And then in verse 39, at that time Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Let's pray together. Father, we recognize the place of your word that guides us, that leads us, into the truth, into understanding who you are, who we are, what you've done for us, who you're calling us to be. We pray that through your spirit that the lies that we hear around us at times that tell us we're unloved, that tell us that we don't matter, whatever those lies are that we listen to, would you help us in this moment to receive your truth, your word, to consider from this story of two unexpected pregnancies with two women how the hope of the world, how the light of the world has come. So raise up our eyes, Lord. Enable us to see with hearts of faith what it is you have for us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I'm going to share with you briefly ways that in this These two encounters we see, uh, Mary's encounter with the angel and then Mary's encounter with Elizabeth, uh, ways that we see Mary as an example of faith. One of the things that strikes us in this story is Mary is a teenage girl of no particular significance. You know, in the order of the world, of power, of wealth, of politics, we might think because of the way the world goes that, that those who have a, a public place of standing that, or power or leadership, that God would choose those people to bring the Savior into the world. But here we see that God chooses Mary. And she has no particular significance, no wealth, no power from the vantage point of what the world values. Luke describes her as a humble servant of God. But while the world doesn't see any significance in Mary, this teenage girl, ordinary person, the angel tells Mary that God sees her, and he highly favors her. Here we have a picture of, of again, what is at the heart of the gospel, what is at the heart of the Christmas, that is that God cares, and he reaches out to people, especially to whom the world considers weak insignificant, powerless. And God chooses the weak to be exalted. He chooses the poor, and he chooses those who are humble in their heart. 
This is not new in the story of Scripture. In fact, if you read the Old Testament, it's, it's full of stories of God choosing the younger brother, the weaker, those who, who wouldn't fit the mold of what we would think to be used by God. His choice of King David, the younger brother, the one who is out with the sheep, remind us of this theme. God often chooses what is weak to accomplish his purposes. 1 Corinthians 1, 27-31 reminds us of this. Paul writes and he says, But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one, no human being may boast before him. It is because of him that you, that I, that we are brought into Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God that is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. That passage applies so well to, to Mary, teenager, no particular importance, a humble servant of God. God sees her heart, He sees her humility. And while the rest of the world sees no value, no strategic significance of Mary, God highly favors her. The next thing that we see is that Mary's response is not just automatic blind faith. And this is significant because I think for many of us, maybe we haven't made the decision to follow Christ or to believe uh, the gospel because we are in a position of believing that it requires this, this blind leap of faith, almost that we're supposed to shut off our minds. And it's important that we catch here in Mary's response is our model she first reflects with her mind. And sometimes we can miss this, but when the word of God comes to her through the angel, she responds with her mind in in reflecting on God's word. In fact, her first response is fear. She's afraid. She's troubled at what does this mean. Then the angel comes and says, do not be afraid. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And what does Mary say after that? How can this be? (laughs) So she's responding and she's reflecting on God's word and she says, but this is not possible because I am a virgin. How can these things take place? I'm not yet married to Joseph. And she has doubts here. And I just want to pause there because some of you might have heard that to be a Christian means no doubts. And it's important that we distinguish that there are different kinds of doubts. There's the doubt that we see here. So it's, it's a doubt that does not stem from a heart that is turned away from God, but from a heart that knows and worships God. And, and that is Mary's heart here. She is a humble, young follower of God. She fears God. She, is, she worships him. She walks with him. But yet she has doubts for how this could actually happen. And there's a difference between that kind of doubt and doubt that arises from a heart that knows a heart, a heart that is hardened and does not long to turn away from its sin to God. So it's important that we see that, that, that there is a real place for doubt and not understanding and, and searching a matter out and, and not seeing how this can be and, and questioning that with the mind. There is a place for that, but there's a difference between that and a heart that is hardened against God that won't even reflect on the word of God, that doubts in a firm resistance of God. So Mary doubts, but then she trusts in the character of God, even when it doesn't make sense. So Mary begins with fear, moves to doubt, but then as the angel speaks to her about what God is doing in accordance with Scripture, in her faith, in her heart, 
even though it doesn't make sense, she trusts in the character of God. And because she knows who God is, that he is the creator, that his power is limitless, rather than, than, than looking at it and going, it doesn't make sense to me, so I'm going to trust my own understanding, instead she trusts in who God is, that his word does not fail, that he can accomplish the impossible. Psalm 9, uh, 7 through 10 gives us a good vantage point of this kind of faith. The psalmist says, The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He rules the world in righteousness and judges the peoples with equity. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. In verse 10, Those who know your name. Trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. This is the humble heart of Mary. I don't understand this. I have doubts. But I know who you are. You've never forsaken me. You've never failed me. God welcomes the doubts and the confusion and even the fears that come from a heart that trusts in his character. And Mary models that authentic faith for us. A genuine faith that trusts in the Lord and in his character and who he is, even when things don't make sense. And she is willing to embrace the impossible and allow God to fulfill his plan. And I want to say his disruptive plan in her life. I mean, think about it. She's pledged to be married. They're making plans Her future is lined out for her. She's encountered Joseph, and they're going to get married. Then they'll start their family, probably in the family profession, as many families did during this time. But then here comes this disruptive plan of God, and it doesn't make sense. But Mary, in her humble heart, trusts in the Lord and accepts that plan. Her response is one of of the greatest examples of faith that we see. She says in verse 38, I'm the Lord's servant. That's my identity. I belong to the Lord. May your word to me be fulfilled. May the will of God be accomplished exactly as you have said. Then the angel left her. Mary models a humble obedience and a patience as a servant of God. And it's important for us to, because we, we, we're reading scenes of this, uh, a story, it's easy for us just to make the, length, the, the mental jump. Like, okay, so she's pregnant and the promise is fulfilled. That was easy. But no, these promises in Mary's life unfold over months and years. And it's important that we catch that, that that not only through the pregnancy, but also after the pregnancy, the birth, and we see things not going apparently as planned. They can't find a place to have the baby. (laughs) This is the king, the savior of the world coming, and everything seems to not be working out and and, and you can follow it through the life of Jesus. Even when he's a boy, Mary loses him. Mary and Joseph lose him. If you remember the story and, and dealing with the realities of that, and we can move forward into the story, and we can see how throughout Jesus' entire life, Mary's there. At the beginning of his ministry, Jesus isn't eating because he's helping the poor, and Mary, is, his mother, is concerned about him. The brothers believe he's gone crazy, and, and Mary is living this reality out to the point of when Jesus would be handed over betrayed and arrested, and when she would see her son murdered on Calvary, the crucifixion. The gospel writers tell us that Mary was there. She stood there and watched that. So it's important for us to see, although she in faith believes what the angel tells her, throughout this life there will be challenges. It's important that we catch that in our faith when we hear the Christmas story and when we have the presentation of the gospel and God's love to us as our creator sending his son to restore all that is broken, to remind us that who we are in this life, first and foremost, is we are made by God and loved by God. And life only makes sense when we understand who God is and who he's made us to be. We're made to live under his rule, his reign, to know him as our loving father, to have a right relationship with him, to follow his ways, to love God fully and love one another. That's how we're made. And life only makes sense when we live 
that way. But Mary also reminds us that life is not easy. Following God's plan is disruptive. It involves doubt. It involves circumstances that don't seem to make sense. But she leaves a path for us. There's a path of faith. There's a path that does voice those doubts. It's a path that at times is a little fearful but it's a path that ultimately trusts in the character of God and commits to follow him with humble obedience. Section ends here with Mary rejoicing in the glory of God, and we have this encounter between her and Elizabeth and John the Baptist, who's three months away from being born, leaping in her womb with joy. Elizabeth, knowing that the pregnancy of of Mary's is remarkable, that it's what God has done and is doing in the world, and and there's this awareness of that so much so that she refers to the baby as Lord that is in Mary. But Mary's response in this is one of not exalting herself. But in Mary's song is a song of bringing glory to God, precisely because he has chosen her weakness. That Mary has embraced her humble posture, her brokenness, her weakness, as what God has used to bring about his glory. She understands that God's power is made perfect in weakness and that in the coming of Christ to the world, the world's order is flipped upside down. The last, the outcast, the poor, the forgotten, the insignificant are first in the kingdom of God. The broken, the sinful, the outsiders are brought into the table. There's a complete reversal of the order. One commentator says this, it's not so much that God's people are given power now. So Jesus comes and he gives us actual political power and material prosperity, but rather that under God's new reign, there will be a new scale of values. And the old social divisions no longer matter. The first are last and the last are first. So in the church of Jesus Christ, it is the weak that we exalt. We go to the poor. We love one another. We care for one another. And we recognize that God brings his glory through weakness. And we embrace that. The Apostle Paul in Corinthians also said, and this is him referring to the message he received from God after dealing with his own limitations that he viewed as a barrier to how God could use him. And Paul says this, my grace is sufficient for you. He's quoting God here. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, this is Paul speaking, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses in insults and hardships and persecutions and difficulties. For when I am weak, that's when I'm strong. Mary's song gives us this glimpse of the beauty of the gospel, of what God has done in exalting the humble and bringing the power structures down. There truly is level ground at the cross. All are welcome. His heart is for the poor, for the weak, for the depressed, for the discouraged, For all of us, his love is for us. And there's something in us that that wants to emulate the strong, the successful, the beautiful. So there's a little bit of a disconnect, and especially we see this reality that we desire to uphold that which is strong. But the gospel reminds us that God is for the weak. He's for the underdog. And that in order to truly receive the gospel message, we have to take Mary's posture. Humility, the lowly place of a servant with nothing to bring to the table. Humble ourselves. God is the savior of the poor and the humble. He responds with his power and grace to those who embrace Mary's posture of humble obedience. Obedience. I have a, uh, I'm a little sentimental in one way, in many ways, Jim would probably say, but... I don't, this is probably embarrassing, but maybe some of you can relate. Um, I have in my cabinet where we keep our coffee cups, one coffee cup that is so significant to me that I kid you not, I will cry when it breaks. And I don't know if any of you are like that 
And you know what's funny about this coffee cup is um, it's, it's just a burgundy cup that has nothing on it. It's insignificant to you. In fact, you would think nothing of it, but, but I literally, I mean, I, I'll say to Jen, and it's just terrible, but I, if I have it out, I'm like, yeah, careful with my cup, careful with my cup. And I only drink out of it on special occasions, and it, it's really irrational. Any other cup that has a chip on it or has a crack in it, I'm just going to throw away right away. It's meaningless. But that cup, if it gets a crack on it, I'm gonna try, I will not throw that away. And here's why. It's the only coffee cup that is left from the uh, um, plates and cups that we received when we got married. So at our, at our and this is 13, from now 14 years ago, with, uh, we were given a set and all the other cups broke. I don't know how, but they all broke. That cup's the only one. And I've been drinking coffee out of that since the beginning of our marriage. And so I treasure that, and it means a lot to me. Anything else that's broken or cracked, I'm just throwing away. But that has significance to me. You know, and, and uh, one of the things that, that comes to my mind, you know, when we think of things like that, oftentimes if something's broken, if it doesn't matter, if it has a crack in it, we throw it away. If something no longer works the way it should, we throw it away. When something's broken, it's bad, we toss it. It means nothing. But Mary's example shows us God favors what is broken. He favors what is weak. And I think it's hard for us to get to that place to understand that, that God does know you. He knows what's broken. He knows what's not right or what it should be. He does know it all, but he loves you. And there's something in us that says that just can't be so. Because that's not how it works. But what we see in the example of Mary is a love of God that comes out of his heart, that isn't based upon us, that he gives freely to us because of who he is. So Mary invites us to embrace our own brokenness to not cover it, to not hide it, but to bring it before God, to embrace the posture of a humble servant, to take the path of humble obedience in trusting him. That's what Mary reminds us of. And then to give glory and to rejoice when God is glorified. When he is lifted up, our hearts are glad. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you here in this passage that is very familiar. Father, we have the example of this seemingly insignificant teenage girl. While the world is looking elsewhere and she seems to not matter, you choose her because of her humble faith in you. Father, she's left a pathway for us and we would pray that above all this Christmas season that you would remind us that you have chosen what is weak, what is broken, what is forgotten, to be exalted. Father, we pray that each one of us here today, that you would examine our hearts through your Holy Spirit. And Father, we know one of the greatest enemies that we have to really receiving this wonderful gift of Jesus and walking after you is its pride, its, its arrogance, its self-sufficiency. Father, we would pray that you would help us in our hearts, regardless of where we are or what our positions are at work, at home. Would you help us to embrace a humble posture before you? Because what we desire more than anything is to have hearts full of your love. So, Lord, help us to look up to you so we won't look down on other people. Lord, as we look up to you, we see how, how wonderful you are and how, just as Mary received you, Jesus, not just into her body as a mother, but into her heart as Lord, you call us to receive you with hearts of faith that trust in you. And Father, help us to have a long faith like Mary's, 
Lord, help us to remember that the call in following you as you unfold your plan of salvation and what you're doing to restore this world, Father, it unfolds throughout our lives and throughout history. And help us not to despair when we can't see the outworking of that. Help us to remember how Mary and her faith at times this didn't make sense. At times she did not understand. At times the circumstances seemed to contradict the message of your love and grace and of the coming of Christ. Yet she in humble faith said, I am your servant. Let your plan be fulfilled. Father, for those here today that are are maybe in a season like that of it doesn't seem to make quite sense what you're doing. Father, remind them that you are true to your word. Not a single word of yours will ever fail. That you will fulfill your promises. And Father, would you help us to model your downward mobility in your love. How you go to the weak. Father, how you uh, call us to not lift up ourselves, but to lift up others. Lord, help us not to seek praise from each other or to seek prominence or positions of power over one another. Lord, help us to seek to let other people receive praise. Help us to be people who build up, not tear down. Father, as we enter this holy week, this week of celebrating your birth, and as we anticipate Christmas Day with our families and friends, Lord, help our hearts to, to slow down, to give thanks for the wonderful gift we have of Jesus. Father, we thank you for your love and for your grace. And now as we sing of that love, would you be honored? Would you be glorified? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.